I um, was part of helping to plan this program, and I went away for a week um, overseas, and I came back and found myself on the program, which um, <laughs> wasn't really kind of my intention. Um, I was in Melbourne a short time ago, and I went into a bookshop that I liked visiting, and um, just sort of was looking around the shelves. And this is a small proportion of the shelving that was devoted to nutrition or diet books. And I did a quick count, and I mean, I wouldn't want you to hold me to it, but it was something like 110 titles around nutrition uh, and diet of some, some kind. Uh, so it's hardly surprising, I mean, you can look at some of the titles there, it's hardly surprising that the public is confused and, um, in fact, it's not only the public that's confused, it's health professionals that are confused. It is indeed sometimes dietitians who are confused, and certainly uh, medical practitioners are regularly confused. Um, so, um, this was a very interesting article, which Rachel Taylor drew my attention to fairly recently, published in the journal Science, which I think most people would regard as a pretty reputable journal. And it was a project which involved the investigators chasing up something like 126,000 stories, news stories, which had been tweeted by something like 3 million people. Um, and they were sort of news stories, which these researchers collected up and submitted to review by independent uh, fact-checking organizations. Um, the idea was really to try and look at the penetration of these articles that were divided up into true or false as defined by these independent organizations. And um, there was, I think, uh, it says on the slide, something like a 95 to 98% agreement on the classification as to whether these things were true or false by these six independent uh, fast-checking organizations. And uh, the findings, I guess, were not surprising, but uh, really very striking. And that is that falsehood diffused significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in every single category of news that was uh, subjected to this analysis. Now, I mean, uh, we're not going to cover every category. Obviously, I'm going to be talking about uh, nutrition and I really just want to start off by reminding you, although you don't need reminding, of why this true and false is so important in nutrition. This is a brief picture, and I think Rachel showed you a version of this earlier on this morning, of the contributions to the New Zealand burden of diseases. And the red arrows uh, alongside some of these diseases, which you see there, are the diseases in which nutrition plays an important role. And, I mean, these range from coronary heart disease through to some of the commonest cancers and diabetes. So, what I'm really trying to say is that it's pretty important that if nutrition is so important in all these diseases which contribute to our global burden of disease, we need to get right what just nutrition is contributing and how we might modify uh, nutrition. Doubly important is the fact that, nu that nutrition and overweight and obesity has now apparently overtaken tobacco consumption as uh, the critical causes of um, uh, these, um, uh, you know, this contribution that I've been talking to, to this global burden of disease. So if diet, overweight, and obesity are that important, clearly we need to make sure that our messages are right. Now, <clears throat> this slide is simply uh, an attempt to represent what uh, we who represent conventional nutrition advice uh, believe uh, should be the message. And the message is actually a very broad message. The message says you can have a wide range of intake of carbohydrate, as you can see, relatively low, 45% uh, of total calories to 60% total calories a relatively broad range of fat intake from relatively low to high-ish, uh, similarly for protein, uh, and a recommendation that fiber-rich food is good, uh, a suggested more than 30 grams a day. 
But the underpinning message is that within these uh, ranges of intake of nutrients, uh, a wide range of foods is acceptable, a wide range of individual foods is acceptable, and it is the nature of the food and the nature of the carbohydrate and the nature of fat which is actually important. So how do we come, how does conventional nutrition, uh, the sort of nutrition that the WHO believes is correct, that the heart foundations of the world believe are correct, the diabetes associations of the world believe are correct, how is this uh, information gathered? What does this information consist of? I'm just going to take you through a very brief uh, summary of the sort of information that we use. We use epidemiological information that comes from cohort studies. This is just some information uh, from uh, a study that our group has published uh, fairly recently, as you can see in the Lancet, looking at dietary fiber intake in uh, a meta-analysis that is aggregating all the cohort studies that had been done. And what you can see on this slide is that um, there is a strong inverse relationship between dietary fiber and risk, that is the risk decreases of uh, colorectal cancer on my right, uh, total mortality over there, type 2 diabetes over there, as fiber intake uh, increases. And this is uh, really very striking. If you look at people who have very, or not very, but relatively high intakes of fiber, roughly over 25, 30 grams a day, that sort of intake compared with people who have lower intakes of fiber, down sort of 15 grams in that range, all of which are consumed by lots of people in the population as a whole, there is something like a 15% reduction in risk of all-cause mortality, a 30% reduction in risk of coronary heart disease, um, uh, mortality and, and slightly less of incidence, and diabetes incidence, colorectal cancer incidence, cancer mortality are all really dramatically increased by an intake in fiber, which is giving you an indication of the right kinds of carbohydrate, the whole grain carbohydrates and, and other fiber-rich sources of carbohydrate. Uh, it's unsurprising that diabetes and coronary heart disease are reduced uh, when you see and compare high and low versus fiber intake, that body weight is lower in high fiber, people who eat a lot of uh, more fiber, uh, cholesterol levels um, and indicators of diabetes are also reduced in people that eat fiber uh, in substantial amounts. Now, this is a cohort uh, approach, which, of course, uh, implies association rather than cause, but the dose-response effect you see here is very suggestive uh, that this, is, this may well be causal, or is probably causal. Clinical trials are the kind of things that most people believe are terribly important in establishing causality and establishing whether we should be doing something about the problem we're talking about. And um, you've heard this morning about some of the trials of diabetes which have been undertaken in re reducing the risk of diabetes. This is actually a Finnish study, which was one of the first formal studies looking at people at risk of diabetes and randomizing them onto this kind of diet, which is shown up here, which is a, a very good reflection of the diet that I showed on the, on the earlier slide, the right kind of carbohydrates, the right kind of fats, and an attempt to achieve some weight reduction. Um, and the, uh, in the experimental group, the control group, were told to go back to their GPs and do whatever their GPs told them, which certainly didn't include a lot of information about nutrition. And this, is, this particular study showed a 60% reduction in the risk of developing diabetes over not only the next five years, which was the nature of the trial itself, but in fact, uh, there are 18-year data to show that this risk reduction in the region of 60% um, continued for that length of time. And this slide that I've got up here shows you that those people that did all five things that they were advised to do in the previous slide, very few of them actually went on to get diabetes. So a 60% overall risk reduction and uh, an even more striking uh, reduction if they did everything they were told to do. 
It's not just Finns who are particularly compliant with dietary advice, but Americans who are probably less likely to be compliant with dietary advice, given the same kind of diet, the same sort of people, uh, people at risk of developing diabetes. And you can see this is the, um, uh, the uh, incidence of developing diabetes. And you can see that people who were given a placebo tablet had a much greater risk of getting diabetes than those who got the lifestyle advice in green. People who got a drug treatment, uh, which might be expected to reduce their risk of diabetes, did somewhere in between, and not anything like as well as those who achieved the lifestyle um, measures that they were instructed to follow. So that's the sort of clinical trial. Those are people at risk of diabetes, a remarkable trial that's been published relatively recently uh, from Scotland and the north of England principally by Mike Lean and various colleagues, looked at people who actually have diabetes, established diabetes, and put them on a, uh, a, a very strict diet to start off with, a formula diet, which was aimed to achieve roughly 15 kilograms of weight loss. And um, then after a while, uh, when they had achieved this weight loss, they were then put back onto a normal diet. But again, the kind of diet that is reflected uh, in what I showed in my second slide, a sort of generally healthy eating pattern. And this study achieved equally remarkable results. These are 12 months data, but there are far longer follow-up data available now, and similar trends are apparent, and they're looking at even longer-term follow-ups now. And what this slide is, is showing is that something like 4% of people in the control group, top right-hand panel, 4% of them um, were able to um, uh, show a, a, what is called a remission of diabetes, that is to say they were able to stop all their treatment, um, but in the intervention group that were able to lose weight and uh, on this fairly strict regime, nearly half of them uh, showed remission of their diabetes. And for those that actually achieved the 15 kilograms of weight loss, nearly 90% of them showed remission of diabetes. And once again, the type of diet that they were put on was that diet which I have described a, a number of times. The story of a coronary heart disease benefiting from that kind of diet is a more complicated one. And um, there really isn't time to go through it in detail because some people have questioned the role of um, uh, the sort of this uh, generally healthy diet in terms of coronary heart disease risk reduction. Uh, but there is a moderately strong body of evidence which shows benefit in terms of coronary heart disease, uh, which I've tried to summarize on this slide. And in the interest of time, um, I am not going to go through the slide now, but if anybody wants to sacrifice some of their lunch hour, I will volunteer a tutorial uh, during uh, lunchtime. So um, please sign up for that at the desk outside. So um, I think the evidence is pretty strong. It's pretty hard to summarize it in about 10 minutes. But what I want to show you now is an alternative approach that has been suggested. I mean, I could show you many examples, but I'm going to show you one example of an approach which is probably the most popular current approach uh, as an alternative to the sort of diet that convention tells you is beneficial. And I just put this up here. This is very typical of the hate mail I receive uh, on a regular basis. <laughs> Dear Dr. Mann, I am a GP and have been giving low carbohydrate diet advice to my type 2 diabetics and pre-diabetic and metabolic syndrome patients for some time with great success. Good to see it's being endorsed by the ADA. Not quite true. But, um, and other diabetic associations, I hope you can find the way to read the science and modify your stance accordingly. <laughs> you know, I mean, that is mild by comparison with some of the mail I receive. Well, surely you'd really want to believe diet doctor. Would you not want to believe a man with a stethoscope around his neck who, uh, some, some of my colleagues thought he looked rather shady. Others thought he looked very handsome and surrounded by the alternative diet. What is the evidence that this diet looks, uh, is, is good? Now, there's a very good paper actually written in 2015 as to why low-carbohydrate diets are good for people with diabetes, uh, and the same has been argued for a ketogenic diet. Um, uh, 
but I'm just going to show you the sort of pictures from this paper, because it's actually a very good summary of the material that people use to justify a low-carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet. So there's, first of all, there's sort of um, ecological evidence, or what's described as ecological evidence. Uh, as you can see, diabetes going up there, at that little bluish panel in the top in the right hand there. Diabetes going up, people, millions of people, more getting diabetes all the time. And what you can see there is that uh, really the main thing that's happening is that calories are increasing, that blue line, carbo calories are increasing, and carbohydrate is increasing, and fat is really not changing. So ecological evidence suggests that diabetes is increasing because you're eating more carbohydrate and therefore more calories, so carbohydrate's bad. But ecological evidence everybody acknowledges is not the be-all and end-all. Now, enormous amount of evidence of this kind. Effective diet on weight loss in people with type 2 diabetes, but there is similar information in people who haven't got diabetes. And what you can see here is that if you put people on a healthy eating diet, you lose some lose a little bit of weight, but most people uh, really only start losing weight when they go on a low-carbohydrate diet. That's a randomized controlled trial. So that looks pretty darn impressive. These are people with diabetes, and you see dramatic improvements in hemoglobin A1c, an indicator of diabetes, an important indicator of diabetes over a 24-week period on the low-carb diet, um, uh, compared with an ordinary low-calorie diet. This looks better and better as we go on. And really what is very exciting, surely, is what happens to uh, the lipid profile when you look at a low, very low carbohydrate diet, and the very low carbohydrate diet is the one in, uh, in red uh, compared with some other dietary approaches. But what you can see here is in this last panel a dramatic reduction in triglyceride, which is uh, believed to be very important in diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. Actually, an increase in high-density lipoprotein, the good cholesterol, which is very exciting, and the best results in terms of um, uh, blood glucose and in weight um, and hemoglobin A1c are once again on the very low carbohydrate. This does look impressive. I mean, you must be impressed by this. And it's the sort of thing that impressed Mr. Atkins, um, who was really one of the first people to suggest that the very high-fat, low-carb diet was a good thing. But it wasn't only uh, uh, Mr. Atkins. It was Time magazine. It was um, The Guardian, the, my favorite newspaper internationally, and indeed the BMJ that actually espoused um, this uh, suggestion that low-carbohydrate diets were good. And then came the ultimate study, which was published, as you can see, in, uh, just a few months ago, and what stimulated, in one day, 15 emails to me, uh, far more severe than that one I read out to you a few minutes ago, and said, well, you absolute idiot, if you've missed all the information that has come up to now, this is the ultimate piece of information. And this was a trial... Uh, as you can see, a two-year non-randomized trial which looked at people who were identified in diabetes clinics that were put onto what was called a continuous care intervention, CCI, compared with continuing with their usual diets. And look at the results. They must be incredibly impressive. If you look at the one-year results, you can see that people who were on the CCI diets lost 14 kgs. At two years, they'd still lost 11 kgs compared with the people who were on UC, that is usual care, which is um, uh, virtually uh, no change at all. And miraculously, the CCI group, something like 18%, showed a, a remission of their diabetes. So this looks incredibly impressive. This continuous care was a remote continuous care. They achieved a lot of, um, they were given a lot of free food products, and um, they were given a, a great deal of advice uh, as to what they should do. The usual care people just went on doing the same old thing that they'd always been doing. Well, I wouldn't have thought you actually needed to have done a course in evidence-based medicine, epidemiology, or indeed gone beyond about uh, you know, third form mathematics to know that that was an unfair comparison, a totally inappropriate comparison of a terribly potent intervention compared with virtually nothing. And in fact, uh, 
uh, you know, what more can I say? I mean, I, words fail me uh, in terms of the fact that a medical journal could actually publish an article like this. In addition to that, uh, totally true that you get weight loss uh, if you go on to one of these very low uh, carbohydrate diets or a keto diet. But what we showed in collaboration with some of my colleagues from Norway, paper published earlier this year, if you look at the top panel, another meta-analysis, uh, short term, if you aggregate all the studies of weight loss, uh, yes, indeed, you see weight loss in the short term. But have a look if you look at studies that have gone on below, uh, beyond 12 months, there is absolutely no difference in the weight loss achieved by very low carb diets compared with higher carb diets. Uh, the effect goes away. Precisely the same thing applies to blood glucose control. Yes, of course you get improved blood glucose control in the short term, but in the long term uh, there is absolutely no proven benefit. Why do uh, we see some of these disadvantages, even in the short term, of high carbohydrate diets? Well, one of the problems is that the vast majority of people have regarded carbohydrate as carbohydrate. They have not accepted what I said in my second slide, and that is, it's the nature of carbohydrate is important. Obviously, if you're going to eat bread that looks like this in the right-hand panel, yes, you're not going to see any benefits if you have a moderate amount of this kind of carbohydrate. Uh, when I said one can have a whole range of carbohydrates, yes, you can have a whole range of carbohydrates, but it's got to be that kind of carbohydrate in the left-hand panel. Uh, these are other carbohydrates that are good. I mean, these are legumes, lentils, uh, beans, a whole range of dried beans. These are the kind of carbohydrates that one has to have if one's going to have uh, uh, a wide range of carbohydrate. And I won't say anything more about that variety of carbohydrate, which clearly nobody is advocating. My penultimate slide is really um, a, a, a sort of epidemiology, a little bit of epidemiology 101. Um, and that is, how do we decide on the best nutritional dietary options? And the answer is, one has to look at a whole range of uh, approaches and then take an overall, uh, uh, make an overall judgment as to what one believes is right. One looks at the experience of populations, the nutritional adequacy, of course, is terribly important. There's epidemiological research, which ex involves the examination of cohort or prospective studies. One looks at clinical trials of either biomarkers of something like cholesterol or clinical endpoints themselves, be it cancer or coronary heart disease or diabetes. And one of the things that uh, I'm leading into what will come later on, we have to consider sustainability. Even if we were to actually believe that a high-fat, high-protein diet was pretty good for health, we'd have to ask ourselves if it was sustainable for the planet, something which has been totally ignored in many nutritional recommendations until very recently. I would submit, and uh, this will be part of the lunchtime tutorial for anybody that wants more, where I will go into this in greater detail, that the kind of diet that has been advocated by the World Health Organization, every heart foundation, uh, internationally, uh, the New Zealand government and every other government that has cared to make recommendations is one which fulfills pretty much all these criteria. Um, the high fat, low carb diet might do some good in the short term, but as I said on morning report to Corin Dan when he interrogated me this morning and asked me whether I thought his paleo diet that he attempted from time to time was doing him any good, uh, um, well, I won't say what I said to him on national radio, but I have had some complaints already. Um, so um, that's what I think we should be doing, and I've tried to tell you why.